Hi, every hi everyone. It's um, Isabel Higgins speaking, and um, I have to confess this is my first attempt at uh, recording uh, such a lecture. I don't actually have an audience. I have the screen looking at me, so forgive me if I stumble. Um, uh, today I'm going to talk to you about participatory action research. And just by way of background, um, I am a qualitative researcher and my qualitative research background includes uh, phenomenology is probably my strength. Um, it was my area of interest uh, during my PhD studies. But of course, since completing my PhD, I have been involved in uh, critical ethnographies as well as action research and mixed methodologies. Um, I've also done some discourse analogy, uh, analysis and um, narrative analysis. But today I'm going to focus on participatory action research. The aims of uh, today's discussion are to define and clarify the purpose of action research, to explore its origins, outline the main characteristics of participatory action research, and share some examples of PAR. And in sharing those examples of PAR, um, what I've found in, in the past that it's a lot easier to bring to life uh, some of these methodologies with some examples and real life experience. Now having said that, um, the focus of uh, the, my, my research has been on the use of Koch and Kralik's method of uh, participatory action research. Now Koch and Kralik are well published in this area and they uh, would claim that their particular style of participatory action research uses a storytelling process and I'll um, explain that a little bit more in time. So, definition of participatory action research. Action research is a participatory democratic process concerned with developing practical knowing in the pursuit of worthwhile human purposes. It seeks to bring together action and reflection, theory and practice in participation with others in the pursuit of practice solutions to issues of pressing concern to people and more generally, the flourishing of individual persons and their communities. I think there are several key words in this uh, particular definition, apart from the notion of action, that it is participatory. In other words, it involves participation with others, and that level of participation is democratic. In other words, all people in the process are equal. And the concerns of action research are largely in developing um, issues surrounding um, uh, uh, or issues of interest, of particular interest to the particular group of people concerned. And in that way, it, um, the, the process develops what they call practical knowing or knowledge, um, knowledge in practice or praxis. So it, it seeks to bring together the, the notion of action. So in, in, in the process of, of focusing on action, we invite um, each other to reflect against theory and within the context of practice and to participa participate together with others uh, in the pursuit of um, finding practical solutions to issues of, of major concern, as I said, to the people uh, in, involved in the group. And in this process, uh, what Reason and Bradbury argue is that it, there's generally a flourishing of individual persons in their communities. In other words, the process is argued to be, or arguably, a liberating process. So the purpose of action research, it shouldn't be surprising, therefore, to learn that the purpose is to liberate the human body, the mind and spirit in the search for a better and free world. So in other words, action research values human experience to the extent that it is a process that involves working with people as co-researchers in the recreation or creation of aspects of their experience or world that gives them a sense of liberation and freedom and that empowers them to be able to do for themselves, in other words, towards action. So the origins of action research are actually very interesting. Um, in the beginning, it, it was attributed to Lewin, 
uh, Kurt Lewin from 1820 to 1947, and he was the founder of modern social psychology. Now, Lewin was born in Prussia and educated in Berlin. He had experience with anti-Semitism firsthand, that is, um, anti-Semitism is, is against um, uh, Jews, for example, and he served in the German army. Post-war, he migrated to America to seek academic and personal freedom from oppression. For those of you that have done any reading around um, uh, these sorts of issues, uh, anti-Semitism during World War I and World War II will be very much uh, aware of um, uh, the level of uh, oppression and, and the, the lost freedom that, that many people experienced during that time. What's important, though, is that no one person can claim uh, participatory action research as theirs, that it's something that has evolved over time. But nevertheless, um, the uh, uh, protagonists of action research have argued that if you wanted to understand something, then you actually had to try and change it. That's what un underpins the, the philosophy, for example, of Marx, Gramsci, Freire and Fowles Border. Now all of these people have talked in some way about action research and what I'm not going to do in this session is actually go into the various philosophies of Marx, Gramsci, Freire and Fowles Border but I invite you to, to review their readings um, or writings for yourself. But PAR itself emerged in the latter half of the 20th century. PAR is a shift from modern um, positivism to a postmodern uh, paradigm where the world views were challenged. So there was a major shift in world paradigms from where people realised that the world um, or thought that the world and aspects of the world could be uh, measured, uh, those, those that could be seen could be measured and should be measured, and that was uh, pure science. However, over time, um, people started to question um, the value of knowledge um, in that particular paradigm and argued that other aspects of knowledge were equally important, for example, human experience. And so with the emergence of postmodern paradigms, we see a shift in world views um, to, the, to the point where the action researchers argued that in actual fact to really understand something, you, you had to get in and try to change it. Now, there are many forms of action research and the family includes a, a range of practices and approaches with diverse assumptions that underpin them. And again, I'm not going to explore all of those because there are some common um, principles or, or issues involved in, in action research, which I'll come to in, in a moment. Now, Paulo uh, Freire, I guess, is, is a name that you'll come across often in, in the readings of uh, action research, and I guess that's because, as an educationalist um, in the 1970s, he, um, he in his um, time in Brazil, found himself working with people who were oppressed. And so he focused on this notion of the pedagogy of the, the oppressed. In other words, he argued how education itself um, oppressed its peoples and he saw education as a way of actually reversing this. So he broke with the tradition of gathering data on oppressed people, which is what researchers tend to do, we gather data on people, and he decided that he should work with people. Um, so he carried out research with them, hence the term um, participation. And through this process he built capacity in the oppressed people to actually change their lives. So his aim was to transform, help them transform themselves and their lives. At the time, he was considered a threat by the politicians of the day and he was forced to leave Brazil. But certainly, Prier is well known, Prier, sorry, is, is well known for his work in uh, participatory action research. Now, Freire also educated for critical awareness, so his education focused on, on making um, or, or helping facilitate this critical awareness amongst people. He focused on individuals' experiences in order to do this, and he argued that shared investigation was the key. So you can see you know, the significance um, or the importance of participation uh, within this action research process. In other words, 
what he was saying is that there's no point in bringing about change through action unless you're actually working with the people concerned, that they in actual fact have the key to um, the solutions for themselves. And he argued that every person can develop a self-awareness as a result of this. In other words, develop a can-do mentality. And that this self-awareness leads to um, freedom. So by the 70s there was a, a paradigm shift and there were generally three orientations at this time. Uh, Fowles Border um, focused on social renovation for social justice. Gustafsson um, used participatory action research um, as a way of mediating through dialogue and Passmore focused on workplace reform. Now they all challenged the traditional notions of theory and practice as different discourses. Habermas, a postmodern theorist, saw the creation of theory and the development of practice as different activities. Habermas argued that practice discourses locked people into a particular discourse that they could not engage with theory or theoretical discourse. It was anathema to them or foreign to them. Whereas Fowles Border he was more concerned with life conditions which were unbearable in the communities of South America and the collapse of positive values and attitudes towards humankind and nature, in some ways mediated by capitalism and modernism. So Fowles Border was essentially um, looking for social justice for, for an op oppressed group of people, I guess not unlike Friere, um, who did um, his early work in Brazil. They challenged the notion of science as truth, as cumulative, and as a linear complex of rules and absolute laws. They noted that science is actually socially constructed. In other words, we actually make meaning out of science. We, the people, um, constructed ourselves. And they look for, for convergence of popular thought and academic science for the underprivileged who needed the support of science. In other words, you know, how could science um, help people who were uh, socially oppressed, and, and hence, again, the, the work of Fowles Border and, and Friere. They argued that science needed a moral conscience. There was no point in going out and studying insects and, and um, excavating to understand our past history if, in actual fact, we weren't using science to bring about reform for those that were underprivileged. And, and in that way, they argued that science needed a moral conscience. Now many learned people were disappointed with academe and science which seemed unable to resolve the problems of the world at the time and that's why they looked for alternative approaches to research and resolving those regional problems and emerged um, land army in, in India, there were NGOs or non-government organisations emerged in Colombia, there was civil resistance in, in, in Brazil as a result of the teachings of Friere, and in Mexico there was a revision of anthropology to form the National Autonomous University and Institute of Pop Popular Culture. So all of these people were questioning the value of science at the time. So we were seeing a paradigm shift at that time um, against um, method. And Gustafsson, um, you can probably tell by the name, uh, he was a Norwegian who focused on reforming workplace procedures in the 1980s. And he argued that discourse about practice and theory and the notion of mediating discourses, so there was no point in, in, in scientific investigation without actually having conversation around the meaning of practice as it relates to, the, um, to theory and, and in order to bring about change. And of course, Passmore did the same thing, but his focus was on workplace reform. Um, and I guess we em we enjoy today some of those workplace reforms. For example, you know, the seven and a half hour day or the 35 hour week, for example, come about as a result of some of the work of people like Passmore. Now, there are many different forms of action research. The action research family includes a range of practices and approaches with varying assumptions that underpin the form. The characteristics of action research largely include um, uh, 
three main phases. One is, which I've already um, stressed early on, is about participation and democracy. So all of the forms of action research emphasise the, the importance of participation. So it's people or participants act as co-researchers and that the process is democratic. In other words, everybody is equal in this process. So I, as an academic researcher, I know more um, uh, um, of, of a leader in this process than the people that I'm working with, the participants. And I'll, I'll come to that as an example in, in a moment. And that the focus is always on practical issues. It's on practical issues of concern. It's on the everyday issues of concern to everyday people. And that in the process, what we're doing is building knowledge in action. And that knowledge in action, in actual fact, is conceptualised as what we call an emergent or developmental form. In other words, it emerges as we work together and it develops as we work together. And one of the outcomes of that is human flourishing. In other words, people become empowered. They have this strong sense of freedom. So its primary purpose is to produce practice, practical, that is useful to people. Its wider purpose is to enhance well-being politically, economically, psychologically and spiritually. Hence, in the earlier definition, the use of the term flourishing. In actual fact, it's a lovely word that, that brings certainly to mind, um, for me, the, the notion of a, a flower um, um, flourishing or, 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 or native fauna and flora flourishing, growing, healthy, developing. Um, so it is about this wider purpose, this sense of, health, of, of well-being among, among people um, from all angles, politically, economically, psychologically and spiritually. And it's about enhancing equity, again, hence the, the focus on participation and democracy. And it's also about sustainability. In other words, once, once we, we come to the end of this project, that we've come to an action, then, then, then what we're hoping to see is that that the actions are sustainable, that they go on and on and on once the um, research phase is completed. So action research is about working towards practical outcomes and creating new knowledge at the same time. Action, however, without reflection is blind, so you will find integral to all action research processes is, is this process of reflection. Um, it's cyclical, it's reflection on, on action, it's reflection, reflection in practice or praxis that brings about change. Just as theory without action is meaningless, action research is also participative. Only possible with, for and by persons and communities and ideally it involves stakeholders in questioning and sense making that informs the research and in the action which is the focus. So the action is the focus. So the end point is about bringing about change. It emerges over time, it's developmental. Now, participatory action research is now part of developmental institutions such as governments and non-government organisations and the World Bank. In fact, if you were to look at the, some of the literature today around um, some of the word third world uh, countries, you'll find that most of the work going on there is using a participatory action or participatory action research or learning process. So um, what's being argued that in order to bring about change in third world countries, the only way to do that is to work with the people concerned. And so you'll see it in developmental institutions such as governments and non-government organisations and certainly with the World Bank and World Health Organisations, for example. Now what I'm going to turn to is um, a particular approach to action research based on Koch and Kralik. And Tina Koch is a colleague of mine. Um, I currently co-supervise uh, several students with Tina um, using her particular approach. So Koch says we're committed to a just society and our intent is to create democratic dialogue and reform through bringing people together in a safe place. And to achieve this, we're guided by social science and critical social theory. So there are a couple of elements in Koch and Kralik's approach. 
Um, one is, as we've seen previously, is this commitment to a just society. And the intent is around democracy and, and, and dialogue and democratic dialogue. So democracy, equality and fairness and justice and conversation from that perspective and the focus is on reform, in other words, bringing, bringing about change at the same time as working with people, bringing people together. Uh, but in particular in Cox's um, situation, she argues in a safe place, and she's saying that to achieve this, we're guided by social science and critical social theory. In other words, we look at things with a critical lens, just as um, Paolo Alfrier, Fals Borda, Gustafsson and Passmore did. So Cock and Kralik's uh, participatory action research process involves participation by people in all stages of the research process, so arguably right from the start, right from inception, from the research question ideally, right through to the end. So the participants may be involved in the research design, the generation of data, the analysis and the dissemination of findings. And the nature of the research is based on partnership, a true partnership with people and an equal partnership. In Cock and Kralik's uh, participatory action research approach, she says that ways of knowing are valued, so all ways of knowing are valued, all knowledge is valued, and that the theory is generated from experiences, from lives and from understandings. So again, this is consistent with all approaches, uh, participatory action research approaches, that there is the development of theory um, as part of the process. But Cock and Kralik's focus is on from, um, or is, is generated from lived experience and from understanding the, the lives of other people. The theorising helps to explain lives by exposing false ideologies. This is the critical sense of, of the research process. So by exploring um, understandings and experiences, we're also exposing at the same time as we expose, I guess, participants in the participatory action research process to what to what could be, then we're also exposing false ideologies in the process. And the theorising may create opportunities for change. Cock and Kralik's participatory action uh, research foc uh, process focuses on empowerment and power. So it focuses, like all other action research processes, on empowering individuals just through the mere process of participating with others uh, to explore ways of bringing about sustained change, bringing about action. And in that way it empowers individuals and it uses power, I guess, um, in order to bring about that change. It's about an awareness of one's own capabilities and capacity is strengthened by participating in participatory action research. So by working with individuals, you can explore their own capacities and capabilities and use their strengths in order to bring about change. Um, the potential for imbalance in research in the research relationship is investigated. So one of the methods that, that Koch and Kralik use right from the outset um, in the uh, group process is to identify group norms, for example. And so in that way, by establishing group norms, the, the potential for imbalance within the group is actually explored at that point and rules or safeguards are put in place right at the outset to ensure that the participation is equal and that the potential for imbalance is reduced. And actions are sought to redress the power imbalances. And again, I'll share some of that in a moment. Participatory action research views consciousness raising as the key. So by making people more aware of um, what's going on around them or alternative views of the world or alternative ways of being, in actual fact, you're raising the consciousness of individuals and Koch and Kralik see that as key to the process of PAR. The research itself may be educative for both the researcher and the participants because they generate data together. And, and again, in the example that I'm going to give in a moment, um, we certainly discovered that through the PAR process that we were educating the staff, but of course we, um, we as academic researchers learnt a lot from the staff themselves as well. 
and all involved are committed researchers and learners in the process. The aim of PAR is to create social change, which addresses inequity of power distribution. So again, with Koch and Krellick's approach, you see one of the characteristics of PAR, which we've already discussed. It aims to impact on the lives of the participants for benefit, and I would argue also for sustainability. The social change begins with the participants and the idea of consciousness raising. And the action may be limited to consciousness raising. Um, it may well be that you achieve that. Um, I guess one of the characteristics of participatory action research is that, that the agenda is set by the group and so you can't, you can't know what the outcome might be at the beginning and of course it, the outcome may well be just consciousness raising and that in itself is an action. Participatory action research appeals because it translates very quickly into action and it is flexible but it uses a systematic methodology that is ideal for constantly changing clinical and healthcare environments. So again, I've chosen Koch and Krellick's approach because of the, the focus on uh, clinical and healthcare environments. So what I'm going to do now is share uh, with, with you a participatory action uh, project that was conducted in a uh, medical ward um, at the John Hunter Hospital and um, the title of the project is the early detection and prevention of delirium. So this is a recent example of participatory action research. So just by way of background to the, um, the project that I'm about to share with you, uh, it was actually part of a uh, research um, program that was defined by uh, Tina Koch, who was the Professor of Older Person Nursing at the time. And um, she had a program that she called Kickstarting Research Program. Um, and this program, the question that she asked um, was, what are the research questions that she asked, I should clarify, is what are the concerns, claims and issues surrounding older person care within the Hunter New England Area Health Service. And what she did was she interviewed 60 key stakeholders within the Area Health Service um, and she interviewed them during late 2005. And out of those interviews, so she interviewed people like um, the Director of Nursing, the Area Director of Nursing, she interviewed divisional heads, she interviewed departmental heads, she interviewed clinical nurse consultants, she interviewed nursing, man nursing unit managers, she interviewed medical doctors, specialists, um, uh, allied health uh, staff and um, clinical nurses. And her findings pointed to several research priorities, but the top research pr priority was older people and delirium. So you can see that Koch, um, who obviously co-authors the Koch and Kralik text on participatory action research, used a, a, a stakeholder approach right from the outset to establish what the key concerns or issues were. Now, just to clarify um, delirium, delirium is characterised by a disturbance of consciousness and changing cognition that develops over a short period of time and the disorder has a tendency to fluctuate during the course of the day. So th this is a, a, um, a, a syndrome I guess that um, affects frail and older people, its prevalence is quite high. So the problem of delirium is that it, it affects 56% of older people who are admitted to hospital. Now this, this figure, this prevalence figure, in, in actual fact is a bit loose because um, one of the problems with uh, delirium is its diagnosis, is, is, is that the problem of delirium is that people don't recognise it um, until it's too late, but people generally, healthcare workers, when I say people, generally do not recognise delirium readily. It, it may be attributed to something else, for example, dementia, especially in older people. So it's often under-recognised, and when symptoms are recognised, they're often misidentified, misdiagnosed or mistreated. Now, there, what people don't realise is that there are um, different forms of delirium 
So one of the, the um, hyperactive delirium is quite easily recognised. It's often people who are um, quite abusive, swearing, um, wanting to escape, for example, that are recognised as having, having delirium. But there is another form of delirium called hypoactive delirium, and that's well identified. And yet it's more frequent than the hyperactive type. Hypoactive delirium is often characterised by the good patient, the good older patient who's very quiet um, and, and non-complaining, and, and uh, frequently they're suffering with depression. It's associated with an increased length of hospital stay. It's associated with the use of restraints, as you can imagine, with somebody in a hypoactive phase. If they're abusive, aggressive, uh, climbing the walls, for, for, for want of a, a better word or a, a metaphor, um, then this is where you'll see restraints used. Um, they're, uh, they're likely to have falls, they're likely to have pressure areas and they often result in discharge to a residential care um, setting or death. Um, and, and the sad part of this is that it's a, a, a very preventable and treatable uh, condition if it's recognised. It's rarely caused by a single factor and therein lies um, one of the major problems or issues with delirium is that it's often related to a whole range of factors and it, as I said it's pretty So the aim of the pilot study uh, was to test a partnership approach, so to test participatory action research processes within a clinical setting in order to re redesign the implementation and evaluation of best practice guidelines for the prevention, early detection and management of delirium in older people in an acute care setting. So at the time in this particular um, uh, setting, or, or at the time at the John Hunter Hospital, um, there were a draft set of guidelines that hadn't yet been released. Um, when I say draft set of guidelines for the prevention, early detection and management of delirium in older people in acute care that were being developed by staff of Hunter New England Health for implementation into the clinical areas. The research team included uh, Jenny Day, um, who was the research manager, the pilot research manager or project manager, Professor Tina Koch, um, and myself. Uh, at the time, my role in this project was as clinical nurse consultant for older person care at the John Hunter Hospital. Professor Tina Koch was the professor of older person nursing, and Jenny Day was working here um, as an academic member of staff um, a new academic member of staff learning to do participatory action research. We had uh, participant clinicians in the project. There were seven nurses and one physiotherapist. So just by way of background, the invitation to participate in this project went to all staff on the ward concern. So it went to nurses, physiotherapists, dietitians, medical staff, medical specialists, uh, occupational therapists. And we also engaged the services of a high speed um, typist or a Hansard typist and that, that, that person played a very important role in this process in that she was able to type up our meetings and record our meetings, um, provide a written record for all of us to review in anticipation of the next meeting um, and the meetings were held fortnightly. So, so it was very important, <coughs> pardon me, that we had a high, high speed typist for this process. We also had an oversight committee with Professor Dimity Pond, Professor Kitchen Nair, Professor Michael Hazelton and Dr Ashley Cable. Professor Dimity Pond is a general practitioner, Professor Kitchen Nair is a gerontologist, Professor Michael Hazelton is a mental health nurse and Dr Ash Ashley Cable offered expertise in relation to um, acute care. <coughs> the delirium pilot study had approval from the research ethics committee um, and again uh, I've recorded here the, the title was practice redesign and partnership to improve the quality of delirium care for older people and we gained that approval in um, 2006. The pilot was conducted between January and July 2007 on a medical ward in J3 and we had commitment from senior management. We had to have commitment from senior management 
because in order for this um, pilot to be successful, we needed to meet fortnightly and therefore we needed the clinicians to be able to meet fortnightly, which meant um, uh, active support from senior management in order to facilitate the release of clinicians for the meetings. And as you can imagine, the release of seven cl clinicians and one physiotherapist is not something that's easily done in the clinical setting. The participatory action research process um, involves uh, three phases um, using Cock and Kralik's approach. There was a looking phase, a thinking phase and an acting phase. Now probably using the term phase um, is not appropriate because the looking, thinking and acting is cyclical and ongoing throughout the process. So I said earlier that um, Tina uh, Cox's approach or Cock and Kralik's approach uses the storytelling um, process. So in the looking phase we use stories um, and these stories were transcribed verbatim and returned to participants and the analysis was then uh, done against UK PES best practice guidelines. So just to extend, uh, uh, extend this a little bit, the stories that, um, that we used um, during the early meetings of, of the group, the first um, two or three meetings, we um, were invited to uh, do a couple of things. Uh, in the first meeting, uh, earlier I mentioned we talked about, um, as a group, um, defining um, on, a, on a set of group norms. Um, that is, uh, as a group, in order to work together, we agreed on how we would conduct um, these meetings. For example, we agreed that only one person would speak at a time and that everybody's um, uh, uh, story, everybody's input would be valued. We agreed that we would be on time, for example, for meetings. Um, so setting norms right from the outset is very important to that democratic process and, and as I said, you know, respecting the words of another person and allowing people the time to express their ideas is very important to this process. The other thing that we did as um, true to Cock and Kralik's approach was use a storytelling approach. So at our early meetings we were invited all to share stories our stories about caring for older people with delirium. And so every member in that, in that group, so the eight, eight um, seven clinicians, one physiotherapist, um, and also Tina and myself and Jenny Day, were invited to share our stories of working with people with delirium. And interestingly, all of those stories were of people in the hyperactive phase of delirium, that is, people who were quite obviously um, delirious, aggressive, um, shouting, swearing um, and probably needing restraint at some stage or another. Uh, there were no stories about hypoactive delirium, um, much to our surprise. And also as part of the storytelling um, process, we, we were shown a story um, called uh, Through the, the Tiger's Eye and by Eve Clendinen. And this story um, was based on a novel by Eve Clendon and, and it told her story about um, experiencing delirium. Um, she was critically ill and she provided a uh, vivid description of what it was like to experience delirium. Now all of our conversations were transcribed verbatim and all of those transcriptions were returned to all of us as participants. And what we did with those stories over the, the weeks that we met was we looked at, at the stories that we told and we looked at those or reflected on those stories against a set of um, best practice guidelines. Now in relation to the guidelines, um, what I need to say here is that there are some 100 uh, best practice guidelines available for um, the prevention management of delirium, which is interesting, around the world, a hundred, a hundred of them, and yet we still don't use these guidelines. And so it was our challenge to actually explore how we might um, implement best practice using these guidelines because the research literature also tells us that the guidelines just aren't taken up even though they exist. So what we did was we looked at our stories 
and we looked at what each other said and we looked at what the guidelines were telling us. But before we, because there were a hundred guidelines, of course we couldn't expect that all of us would re read those guidelines. So Jenny Day is part of her project management role. Um, basically um, read most of those guidelines and identified um, a smaller set of guidelines that we actually put back or brought back to the group and we together identified the UK best, best practice guidelines um, as our model for, for the purpose of this storytelling process. And so the thinking phase is as, as it says, it is thinking, it's thinking about our stories and thinking about the guidelines that were available to us and where the mismatch might be. So this is where the critical component comes in, is where are the gaps, where are the consistencies, where are the similarities, where are the differences, differences, what isn't happening here and why isn't, why isn't it happening. So in this thinking phase we were reflecting on our stories, reflecting on the guidelines, reflecting on best practice and we were attempting to explain why practice wasn't aligned with the best practice guidelines and we were interpreting the guidelines and interpreting our stories at the same time and trying to find a sense of alignment. The agenda was definitely driven by the group. And so, you know, keeping in mind that what we were looking for was some sort of action, the PAR group decided on the actions to improve practice. And what's interesting is what came out of the group um, was that the clinicians were absolutely clear in their minds that they did not want any more documentation. And I'm sure as, 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 as of, um, undergraduate students in, in, um, in your course, that if you haven't come up against it already, you will eventually come up to this imperative in health to document everything. And, and uh, consistently healthcare um, workers complain that documentation is time consuming and that it takes away time with the patient. So this particular group were absolutely um, committed to not increasing their, their documentation um, uh, outputs or inputs, whichever way you'd like to, to, um, to look at it. I'll come back to this in a moment. So the data sets, what we ended up um, out of this uh, research process were three data sets. We had PAR group meeting data, so we had the Hansard typist or the high speed typist coming to every group meeting and typing up as we were speaking what we were saying at this at this group meeting. And those that that data was made available to everybody in the group before the next meeting and meetings were held fortnightly over a period of about sixteen weeks. We also had research team debrief meeting data, so at the end of each um, meeting with the clinicians, um, myself and Tina and Jenny debriefed at the meetings and we kept that as a separate data set and that's because this was a pilot and what we were interested in was you know how the process was going given that we were introducing the notion of participatory action research within the, a clinical context and for the first time working with clinicians as participants in this research process. Now the third data set was uh, chart, chart audit and ward data. And the reason we had a third data set around chart audit and more data analysis was that out of the um, group process, out of the stories, were um, suggestions um, by the clinicians that they, all of their, their older people within in the ward, within J3, um, had delirium, but we had no evidence to support this. When we actually looked at a retrospective audit of the diagnostic categories for delirium or confusion, what we found was that it was a very small number. And so it wasn't actually backing up what the nursing staff and the physiotherapists were saying. So we decided to conduct our own chart audit. Um, and, and so what we did as a participatory action team was develop an, uh, an audit tool and then over a um, two month period we collected data based on the audit that was developed by the participatory action group um, regarding uh, what we knew about delirium at that time. So we looked at charts, um, a, a sample of charts of older people from the ward J3 and we, what we looked at was any entries um, with regards to delirium 
any entries with regards to confusion. We looked for problems associated with um, uh, infection, for example, we look for histories of chest infection, we look for histories of urinary tract infection, we look for histories of pain, we looked for um, pathophysiological sequelae that may well, um, may well have pointed to um, delirium or at least confusion. And, there, and therein was our war data analysis as a, a separate set and I'll come to that in a moment. So we had 13 meetings in total and each, at each of those meetings we used the Look, Think, Act cycles. We had 12 clinician stories of delirium care um, and we had a focus on hyperactive delirium as I said. And that, um, that data we analysed against um, guideline or against the evidence. And we used, the analysis actually used what are the concerns here, what are the claims and what are the issues. So that was how we looked at the data that we had. In the research team debrief meeting data, we also looked at facilitating, you know, how we facilitated the Look, Think, Act process. We looked at group dynamics and we looked at group development. The chart audit, as I said, we didn't have a ward profile of um, data available to us to tell us how many people had a diagnosis of delirium and what we were looking for was any evidence that pointed to delirium as a possible um, uh, diagnosis in the absence of using a formal assessment form which the evidence says is, is, um, is available. Uh, the confusion assessment, assessment method is very common and very easy to use and yet we don't use it. So you can see the problems um, of delirium, detecting delirium. If we don't assess for it, then we'll never find it. If we don't assess for it, we'll never prevent it. So, the findings and the outcomes. We identified a series of constraints. We developed a protocol and we developed what we called a delirium room and we had a chart, at, a chart audit tool which we developed and piloted. Um, which we're hoping to use for a larger grant later. In terms of the constraints that came out of the data set or constraints to best practice, um, what we discovered was that there were delays um, with transferring older patients from the emergency department to the ward. What the clinicians told us was that um, the Older patients are often transferred late at night. They've been admitted to the emergency department. They've been admitted in pain, for example, um, and, and confused. And oftentimes they're too busy down there. They may well not have been given uh, fluids or food. And then they're transferred late in the, e in the evening, just adding to the older person's confusion. And then from the ward's perspective, problems there were associated with how do they get food late at night, um, yes, they can get fluids late at night, but it's quite disruptive to the other patients. It's dis disorientating and distressing to the patient concerned and the family members as well. They also indicated that the routines or ward activities were not conducive to rest and sleep. So one of the other confounding factors um, in, in relation to delirium, or one of the risk factors for it, is um, sleep deprivation, for example, or, or lack of sleep and, and rest. And so what the staff recognised was that the routine ward activities weren't actually conducive to um, facilitating rest and sleep in older people. Um, one of the, the best practice guidelines also indicate that it's really important to help with the orientation of an older person with delirium who's confused, for example, that relatives um, stay with these patients. Um, and what they noticed or what, what the uh, staff alleged was that the relatives were not able to stay within the, with the patient in the ED department. And as they point out, based on the pre best practice guidelines, that this also assists with orientation and comfort. Um, they acknowledged the um, under-reporting of delirium and attributing acute confusion to dementia. So as I said earlier on in this presentation, that often um, in, in the acute healthcare uh, context, certainly, that when an older person presents with confusion to an acute hospital setting, that there's a tendency to jump quickly to a, a diagnosis of dementia, when in actual fact it may well be delirium. And there's quite a difference between dementia and delirium. Yes, there might be confusion in both cases or both instances, but delirium is associated with frailty and with a range of other risk factors 
uh, that need to be eliminated as the cause for confusion. And of course delirium can lead to imminent death. And a wide range of assessment skills are needed. Uh, this is one of the constraints that the staff acknowledged. And that they were under constraints um, in terms of um, the imperative to reduce the length of stay of any patient in the hospital setting. And in some ways that there was an incongruence with delirium care that time is needed for patients to recover. So out of, um, out of this process, the staff developed, um, not only did they, they develop an audit tool um, and, and reflect on, well, okay, who here is at risk of delirium? Um, who might they be? They decided to move forward with what they called uh, the development of a delirium alert protocol. And I'll show you what the delirium alert, alert protocol looks like in, in um, one of the uh, future slides. Um, so in relation to the delirium alert protocol, um, here's, here's, here's an excerpt from one of the clinicians. I'm not saying we get it right all the time, but we've kind of got a bit of an idea about what we can do, how we can do it. I think the whole prevention thing is identifying these risk factors in our daily practice is really important. Now this is really, this is really important because this, this particular um, conversation signals learning. So recall that um, we had shared stories about caring for uh, people with delirium. We'd heard about Edith Clendenin's experience in delirium and we had explored a whole range of best practice guidelines um, and, and one in particular um, which focused on the prevention of delirium. And the staff developed as a result of this um, process the, the clinician's action was to develop a, a delirium alert protocol and so what they're saying is well we don't get it right all the time but now we've got a bit of an idea of what we can do and how we can do it and the emphasis is on prevention, identifying risk factors in our daily practice and that's really important. So that was very rewarding to see that. The protocol. So the delirium um, alert protocol now, now this is an A4 sheet and this is the front side of the A4 sheet and this came out of the group process. This came out of um, all of us working together with our, our understandings of the best practice guidelines and having reflected on what happens in Ward J3. So we decided as a group, and, and, and I, I guess I should say the clinicians, but I was certainly part of the we as well, that what we, if we made an assumption, and we did check it out, um, so I guess it's not an assumption, Re recall that I said that the staff indicated the clinician's concern said that all of our older people are at risk of delirium. We deal with delirium all the time, and when we went looking to find the evidence, we couldn't find it initially, but when we, when we did conducted the audit, we did find a lot of older people who were at high risk of, of delirium. And so they decided, okay, they needed a protocol that said, that alerted staff to delirium risk. So this A4 sheet goes on the bedside chart on top of the notes at the bedside and it alerts all staff to this person has a delirium risk and it invites staff to look, to listen, to link and think. And when you think about it, this is kind of neat that they came up with it. They came up with a colour scheme and they came up with the words. So let's have a look at look. Look says, look says, look for risk factors of delirium. Now this acronym, CDVAS and IFACT, were developed by the group out of what they had learnt from the best practice guidelines. So CDVAS is, is, is an easy acronym to remember. So C represents cognitive impairment, D represents dehydration, I represents immobility, visual impairment, auditory impairment, sleep deprivation. So now you've learnt about the risk factors for delirium. Uh, these are directly from the best practice guidelines. So first of all, its cognitive impairment is a risk factor for delirium. Dehydration is a risk factor for delirium and that's why I, I emphasised, you know, one of the constraints to best practice was on transfer from ED to the wards, older people are transferred often at, late at night and they haven't been fed and they haven't been watered. 
and immobility. A frail older person will have problems with immobility and many older people suffer with visual impairment. I'm visually impaired without my contact lenses or my glasses. So how often does it happen on transfer to a ward that someone's lost the glasses or they're taken off to go to sleep at night so isn't it any wonder that somebody um, becomes a bit confused. I mean I can be driving at night time um, late at night on, a, on, on the highway somewhere and, and a moonlit night and suddenly I'm seeing things jump out on the road and, and, and you realise it's just the shadow from the moon that's um, created by the trees, for example. And I'm wearing glasses but my vision is not 20-20. So auditory impairment, you know, if you're not hearing properly then you're going to make sense out of your own meaning out of what you're not hearing. And sleep deprivation. Uh, you, you know yourself how you, how you feel if you've had a sleepless night. So, you know, these older people, frail older people struggle um, in, in many ways and sleep deprivation is a risk factor for delirium. So this protocol invites staff to look and look at C. divas. And then it says look for and think delirium. So, okay, now think about, make a connection between C. divas and IFACT. Is there inattention? Because this is the, the other, you know, in the early phases of delirium, if there's a bit of inattention, um, so they may not be cognitively impaired, but they may be a little bit inattentive. Their, their cognition may be fluctua fluctuating, so there may be lucid moments which might alert you to, hmm, wonder what's going on here. And is the changing cognition acute? And in a way, this is the key one of the keys to differentiating delirium from dementia. So dementia is subtly progressive, but delirium is an acute change in cognition, and this is why we invite, invite the thinking, you know, listen to the relatives. If the relatives say, my mother is not normally like this, or my father is not normally like this, then it behoves we as healthcare workers to believe the sons and daughters who say that their family member isn't normally like this. Just because they're old doesn't mean to say that they're demented, that they're confused and demented. So is this an acute change in cognition? Is there a change level of consciousness? Are they hyperactive, i.e. loud and aggressive? Are they hypoactive? Have they become very quiet and subdued? Is there a bit of a mixture of both? So here we now see the different forms of delirium. Is their thinking disorganised? So I think this is really neat. Here's an alert delirium risk. Please look at C. Divas and IFACT. Now listen, listen to the patients, listen to the relatives or the carers and the co-workers. So are the patients, in listening to the patients, are they inattentive? Are, is their thinking disorganised? Are the relatives saying to you, my mother's not normally like this? Or the carers saying, my father's not normally like this? And listen to your co-workers at handover. You know, did you hear... Did you hear your colleague say Mr Brown was really quite lucid yesterday or he was okay yesterday and yet today he's confused? Well, link that and think about it. And can you make the, the link to delirium? If so, take action. So the back page of this A4 document has a set of acknowledgements. So um, just before I get to a little bit, bit of detail on the back page, it acknowledges that this was developed out of practice redesign and partnership to improve the quality of delirium care and the research team members are named. The participatory action group are named and there is a, a reference obviously to um, the, the, the delirium guidelines or the multi-component interventions to prevent delirium in hospitalised older adults. Um, so acknowledging the work of Inui Bogardis, uh, Carpentier and Leo Summers, Akampura, Holford and Cooney, 1999. So just an example of what's on the back page. Um, there are three columns on the back page and in the first column um, the eyes are drawn to the risk factor assessment. So first and foremost is cognition and orientation. If possible, do a mini mental status or a confusion assessment measure. Um, record inattention in and language disturbance. Recording or documentation is so important. And of course the CAM is the gold standard for, for assessing for delirium. Um, the standardised intervention protocol um, says, so the second column, 
is the intervention. So against cognition, this is what you should do. Orientate, reorientate to surroundings, make sure. And this is what the J3 staff said. They, they looked at Inui's protocols and they said, OK, we can't do everything here, but this is what we can do on J3. Yes, we can reorientate to surroundings. We can make the call bell available. Um, uh, we can think about where the bed is placed and where the, the, the room and the, the clock um, is placed and in relation to the ward and other patients. We can provide the day's schedule, we can consider orientating to daily news and TV, so yes, we might have time to, to um, organise a television um, to bring people or, or orientate them in terms of um, what's happening today in the news and attempt continuity of care and ensure that there's some handover to others and involving the carer and the family. Um, and what the outcome, what outcome is hoped against this risk, risk factor assessment is early detection of cognitive changes, improved orientation, and that the patient at least knows their way around the room in the ward. Another example is hydration. So, you know, a moment ago we pointed out that dehydration is a risk factor for delirium. So, um, have a look and see if the, the patient is hydrated, adequately hydrated. Dehydration is identified by electrolyte imbalance. So look at their UECs. Do they have a dry tongue, mouth, poor skin tone? Do a routine ur urinalysis. If it's already done, have another look. Have a look at their oxygen saturations. Look for their jugular ven venous pressures. Have they got a raised JVP? Is it discernible? Monitor their fluid intake and loss and observe for edema. And of course the intervention is um, Continuous assessment for early recognition of dehydration and volume uh, reception. Regularly offer drinks except for those on food restriction. Ensure drinks are accessible. Provide aids as needed. Address volume depletion with intravenous or subcutaneous fluids as ordered. Complete fluid balance. And the outcome is that they're adequately hydrated. That their UECs or urea electrolytes are within normal limits and that the fluid balance is balanced and that their skin integrity is improved, their tongue is moist and urinalysis is within normal limits. So there's another. And there are many more. There's one on mobility, which I'll leave for you to review. Um, you know, mobilising people, ensuring that they're having some exercise and, and also ensuring that they've got walkers and sticks and glasses and slippers at hand and mobilising them. All of this improves mobility and it improves potential changes in enablement and activities of daily living. Now the other areas, um, of, of course, that are included on the, the back of this, this chart uh, relate to vision and hearing and sleep, elimination, medication, um, the prevention of iatrogenic events, for example falls, and ensuring that they're adequately nourished. So each, each one of those risk factors um, or areas is, is detailed on the back of this A4 sh um, sheet so that new staff, if they're not sure, can actually have a look to see what might be required um, and staff who, who um, have a better appreciation or learning of delirium um, can be guided by these areas. Now the other thing I mentioned was the delirium room. So you'll recall that one of the other actions was uh, not only this protocol but also what the staff called a delirium room. And the delirium room, as one of the staff members said, or clinicians said, it's probably been successful in as much as we've been able to take off the restraints. Obviously we haven't changed a lot of the behaviour, but we've just been working within the room and changing practice. Yes, three out of four were quite restless overnight. That's three out of four people. But having said that, their sedation levels have been reduced, the drugs have been um, further reduced today, and no one's been physically restrained since last Friday four days ago. So I think that in itself is a fairly big achievement. Now this, there, there's a lot in this, this small exemplar. The delirium room um, was created because um, staff recognised that they had several older people who were in the hyperactive phase of delirium and they were um, uh, creating a concern discomfort for, for other older patients and that's always the concern. And what they've tended to do in the past is call uh, code uh, red, I think it is, and what happens is that, they, is that the older person ends up restrained. And there's research that shows that the use of restraints in actual fact is probably one of the worst things that you can do for somebody who's in delirium, as, as you can imagine. So the aim is to keep the restraints off. 
So what they did was they set aside a room within the ward or dedicated one area, a four-bedded room, for these people who were hyperactive um, or suffering with hyperactive delirium. And of course they implemented all of the other interventions around the risks, um, uh, individual risk um, factors for each of the patients. But by putting them aside in, in one room and dedicating one member of staff to ensuring that there was presence in order to prevent falls, that they were being, um, that they were able to reach call bells, that they had glasses and teeth and, and that the old person had access to fluids and their, and their foods, then they were at least ensuring continuity here and ensuring that the risk factors were being addressed. They were all, also able to um, turn the lights out earlier and calm or quiet the room. Um, so, so thereby orientating um, the older people in this particular area much earlier. And so for them it was quite an achievement to have actually not used restraints. Now the finding from the chart, the findings from the chart audit. Um, the participants estimated 60% of the ward patients have delirium. What we did was develop a data collection tool or a data audit tool. Um, and as I said, um, we, we actually conducted a, a, a sample of um, 48 patients over, 40, over a 15 day period and we had 37 records that were available for audit. So audit, of the 40, 48 patients that were um, uh, discharged from the ward that were sampled, um, 37 records were actually available for us to audit. Now you'll note that I've got distorted sample due to the storms. Some of you might recall that in Newcastle in 2007, I think the June storms, we had a lot of flooding. And what that meant was that some of the data was um, distorted because the length of stays were longer because some of these older people couldn't go to their homes. Um, so 15 day sample period of discharges, 48 patients but 37 records were available. And what we found was that one, one patient had a diagnosis of delirium in the record and eight patients or 22% of them had um, what we suspected as delirium from the records but it wasn't actually named. So that's quite different. So, you know, you could say 24, 25% uh, 24, of patients on that ward um, uh, possibly had delirium at, at that time and not just one patient or 2.7%. So, um, that gives you a thumbnail sketch of the actions that were derived from the action research process with the clinicians. And this is what some of the participants said after, afterwards. It's showing us to extend our thinking a little bit further. I'm looking at all these points instead of maybe just one or two. It also clarifies your expectations for new staff or anyone who comes. Now this is with reference to the delirium alert protocol. You can say, well, this is the way we approach this and immediately you set the mark of where you want them to be and where you want their practice to be and they go, okay, righto, they're on the ball here. It really does help articulate that quite quite clearly. So, you know, the use of the delirium alert protocol basically to everybody concerned that there's an expectation that you focus on delirium and here are the standards. Another participant said, I enjoyed as well that I learned here. You could go out there and use it on the ward, so I've enjoyed that. It's really good and it's good being part of something as well. So again, this is consistent with the, the, the values of the participatory action research process. Um, it's liberating, it's about learning and it's about action for change. Now, what we did 12 months later was we evaluated the uptake of the delirium alert protocol. So one of the arguments about using a participatory action process is that um, it, it brings about change and that it's sustainable change or sustained change. So in order to show that um, the change was sustained, we evaluated the pilot at 12 months following implementation of the project, of the PAR process. And the leader for this process was Iris Lee, who was on our stewardship program. So the aim was to evaluate the uptake and utility of the DAP by nursing staff. We asked a series of research questions. Has the DAP, or Delirium Alert Protocol, increased staff members' knowledge about delirium, its prevention and detection? Are clinical staff members aware of the risk factors for delirium? Is the DAP or protocol utilised by clinical staff? 
Has there been an increase in the use of preventative nursing strategies for delirium? What are the staff members' perceptions of the utility of the DAP? And what are the staff members' perceptions of the impact of the DAP? And what impact has the protocol had on the identification of delirium? What we did was a repeat retrospective chart audit of patients' records. We used a 23-item questionnaire that was given to all nursing staff on the ward and we used a focus group interview with clinicians involved in the original PAR pilot project. So the repeat re retrospective chart audit of patients' records was to have a look to see whether in actual fact we'd increase the detection of delirium, um, whether there was any shift from that original audit. The 23-item questionnaire that um, we'd given to all staff nursing staff was to determine whether you know whether they'd learnt anything about delirium, whether they were still aware of the DAP, for example. And the focus group interview was to get a sense from the original um, participants of the PAR pilot project um, to get a sense of their views, their perceptions at that time. As I said, the chart audit was conducted 12 months post the delirium alert protocol and we used the same sample number, or 37. The survey of the staff, in actual fact there were 37 members of staff surveyed, 26 returned, so that was a 70% response rate, which was pretty good. And we only had three members of the PAR group, the original PAR group, um, uh, in the focus group. In terms of the um, chart audit, uh, what we see here is um, pre-pilot, you can see that um, the numbers have, have altered. In other words, we're showing a shift in relation to cognitive assessment. Um, the, the cognitive state, recording of cognitive state and the use of a mini mental um, state exam. Um, and, and we make no real claims here. It was a pilot, but you can actually see a shift, which is um, a nice. In terms of the chart audit, um, again, pre and, and post app, the sorts of things that, that um, we looked at were um, what, and this is relying on documentation, so this is important as well, knowing that nurses and healthcare workers generally aren't all that reliable when it comes to documentation. So we're, what we looked at was um, orientation, uh, cognitive reporting, the intake of fluid and nutrition, mobilisation, medication review, uh, the provision of glasses, the provision of hearing aids, sleep. Um, voiding and bowel regimes and involving the family or the sitter environment and pain control. Of course pain is a risk factor for delirium and so again what we see is, is a shift. We see an increase in documentation on all of these measures and again it's a pilot so we're not making all claims here. In terms of the staff survey, um, uh, that the 26 of the staff, or 84% of the staff who completed the survey were aware of the delirium alert protocol 12 months after its implementation, and 86% reported that the DAP was easy to understand. 77% um, of them reported that it was easy to follow when they first encountered it, and when asked if the DAP was easy to explain to others, 68% agreed, 18% um, were undecided and 9% disagreed. 54% of staff believed that the DAP had changed the way that they assessed patients. 63% of staff perceived that they had a greater awareness of the risk factors for delirium. And 59% were aware of the subtypes of delirium. So remember, um, delirium does have three different subtypes, hyperactive, hypoactive and mixed. Um, and our storytelling approach showed that most of us were aware of hyperactive and, and not aware of the um, other two types. 50% of the staff indicated that they had referred to the DAP often or always, which was quite rewarding to see. How often do the staff refer to the delirium alert protocol? And as you can see on this table, that um, uh, there were only two who responded seldom, um, five sometimes, and the remainder, um, 12, often or always. In terms of knowledge of subtypes of delirium, you can see a shift before the DAP and after the DAP, um, quite a shift. And again, because it's a pilot, we're not making any remarkable claims. We're just saying that there has been a shift here, which was quite rewarding. Now, in terms of the focus groups, um, there were three main things that, that fell out of that focus group. One we called the D word, the other um, with reference to the use of triggers at hand, handover. 
and, and the ongoing challenges. In relation to the delirium word or D word. So this happens at um, a handover. So when they say, oh, they're a bit confused, I'd say, I'd say, so we're talking about delirium here or are we talking about dementia? What are we talking about here? And it's usually they'd say, oh, um, it's probably delirium or it is delirium because they're eurosceptic or whatever. So people were starting to make the connection. The use of triggers, people are actively saying at every handover, bowels open, bowels not open, and then saying it's been three days, we need to do something about this. So things are being passed on because that's our primary with delirium. Those are the triggers that we've noted over the last year or so since we've taken an active role in recognising the triggers, bearing in mind that constipation will is one of the risk factors for delirium. Ongoing challenges, that's a challenge to the ward to continue to put it forward. Every new person who comes or someone who doesn't work here regularly needs to be reminded of the prevention of delirium and the DAP. So you're kind of leading them with reference to the resident medical officer a little bit along the way because our doctors rotate every two months and it is a bit of a challenge. And, and I'm sure that applies to nursing staff and I'm sure that applies to allied health staff as well. That as you see a turnover or a change, then, then there is um, a need to remind the newcomers of the need to prevent delirium or the focus on the prevention of delirium. And, and I guess therein lies the power in itself of the protocol which sits on the front of those um, patients' charts. I've listed some further readings um, for you, should you be interested. Uh, there have been a couple of publications from this uh, project, so I'll leave, leave that with you to explore. So in summary, uh, participatory action research responds to practical and pressing issues in the lives of people in organisations and communities. It engages people in collaborative relationships in which dialogue and development flourish and it draws on many, many ways of knowing. It is values oriented. It seeks to address issues of significance regarding flourishing of human persons, their communities and the wider ecology. It is a living emergent process which cannot be predetermined but changes and develops as those engaged deepen their understanding of the issues to be addressed and de develop their capacity as co-inquirers, both individually and collectively. So participatory action research seeks to change practice in our context, and it seeks to do that by empowering people, by facilitating learning, and it is an emergent or iterative process. The knowledge that emerges um, is, an, is, is an iterative process. So we can't predetermine what will happen when we work with these groups. And it's in that way that participatory action research is quite different from all of the other methodologies. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions by email or by phone. And here are the references that I've used, references that I've used for this presentation.